Hello everyone, this is the daily quiz series in the run-up to NEET PG 2025. I shall be dealing with questions from Renal and GI Tract. Let's have a look at the first question. It says, which of the following is the main site for sodium bile acid co-transport? The bile acids, 90% of the bile acids are absorbed from the distal ileum. 5% of the bile acids are absorbed from the colon and 5% of the bile acids will be lost in the stool. So the major site of absorption of bile acids is the distal ileum. There are two mechanisms for absorption of bile acids. There is a sodium bile acid co-transport, which is a secondary active co-transport mechanism. And there can also be something known as a non-ionic diffusion of bile acids. But of course, the major mechanism of transport is a sodium bile acid co-transport. So the answer to this question is pretty simple. This is going to be the distal ileum. Once the bile acids are absorbed, from the distal ileum, from the colon, they will be taken into the liver. This is known as the enterohepatic circulation of bile. This enterohepatic circulation of bile occurs one to two times per meal or five to six times per day. From the liver, there is going to be secretion of the bile acids into the bile canaliculi and then the bile will flow into the duodenum, then the jejunum, the distal ileum and again the reabsorption. This is called the enterohepatic circulation of bile. So answer to this question is C or ileum. Let's have a look at the next question. It says, which of the following is a characteristic of saliva? Hypotonicity relative to plasma, this is true. When you look at the salivary secretion, the primary secretion in the acini is isotonic with plasma. The primary secretion here is isotonic, but as it flows through the ducts, there is a modification which takes place. And what is this modification? Sodium and chloride are reabsorbed and potassium and bicarbonate are secreted. But please remember, the absorption of sodium and, bicar sodium and chloride is much more than the secretion of potassium and bicarbonate. So what will happen to saliva finally? Saliva which was isotonic to begin with. Now because there is more absorption of electrolytes, as compared to the secretion, the saliva will always be hypotonic. So whether it is a stimulated gland or an unstimulated gland, saliva is always hypotonic relative to plasma. Does it have a lower bicarbonate concentration than plasma? No. It will in fact have a higher bicarbonate concentration because there is a secretion of bicarbonate. Are there any presence of proteases? No. Saliva has amylase, which is for the digestion of carbohydrates. It has a lysozyme and it has a lingual lipase. Lingual lipase is secreted by the Ebner's glands on the dorsum of the tongue. There are no proteases. So this is incorrect. Secretion rate is, is increased by vagotomy no vagus is the major mechanism or for the secretion of saliva so vagotomy will in fact reduce it so this is also incorrect the answer to this question is therefore a which is the only correct statement hypotonic saliva relative to plasma Let's have a look at the next question. Now, this says the graph shows the percentage of filtered load remaining of four substances along the length of the nephron. Which of the following correctly identifies the four substances? Now, if you look at this graph, we've got the length of the nephron on the x-axis and percentage of the filtered load remaining is on the y-axis. Now, look at substance A. It was freely filtered, that means in the glomerular filtrate 100%. But then, by 
by the time it reaches the end of the PCT, zero remains in the tubular fluid. All of it is reabsorbed. So this is probably glucose amino acids because glucose and amino acids are absorbed to the extent of 100% in the PCT itself. Now look at substance B. Substance B is also freely filtered substance, so 100% in the filtrate. But by the time it crosses the PCT and comes towards a distal tubule, more than 80 to 90% of the substance is reabsorbed and by the end of the tubule, by the end of the nephron, almost 100% is reabsorbed. So this is probably bicarbonate. 80% of the bicarbonate is reabsorbed in the PCT itself. Look at substance C. Now, this was 100% in the glomerular filtrate and continues to remain unchanged throughout the nephron. There is no reabsorption, there is no secretion. And this substance is inulin. Look at substance D. 100% of the glomerular filtrate. Now, as it moves through the nephron, especially by the end of PCT, the percentage of the substance has increased. How can that increase? By secretion. So a substance which is freely filtered and secreted in the PCT itself is para-aminohypuric acid. Please, please remember when you're looking at these graphs, see what is on the x-axis, see what is on the y-axis. X-axis is showing you the length of the nephron and on the y-axis, the percentage of the filtered load remaining. We did a somewhat similar graph a couple of days back where we had clearance on the y-axis and there was the plasma concentration on the x-axis. So be very, very careful when you look at these graphs, what are they trying to convey? This is trying to show you that there are these four freely filtered substances, but what are the changes occurring to the percentage of the filtered load remaining along the length of the nephron. So here my answer is A, glucose, B, bicarbonate, C, inulin, and D, para-aminohypuric acid. The given image represents which of the following GI movements? Is it going to be peristalsis, segmentation, mass movements, or migrating motor complexes? Now, these are migrating motor complexes. Why do I say so? Firstly, the migrating motor complexes, they start from the stomach and they go right up to the distal ileum. They do not continue into the colon. Second important point. The first migrating motor complex is 90 to 120 minutes after the last meal and then they occur in cycles of 90 minutes. The moment you have your food, these movements are abolished. These migrating motor complexes, they occur between meals in the interdigestive period. The next important point, this is like a ring of contraction from the stomach right up to the distal ileum. This has got three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. What is phase one? Phase one is the quiescent phase. Phase two is the phase of irregular electrical and motor activity. And what is phase three? Phase three is the phase of regular electrical and motor activity. And very important to understand that these three phases together, they take about 90 minutes for completion. Another very important point about the migrating motor complexes is that this is not a neural activity, it is a hormonal activity. This is produced by a hormone which is known as motilin. This is secreted by the MO cells. Motilin is responsible for the migrating motor complexes. Let's have a look at another interesting question. Subjects a and B are 70 kg men. Subject A drinks 2 litres of distilled water and subject B drinks 2 litres of isotonic saline. As a result of these ingestions, which of the following is expected in subject B? 
Now, A has 2 litres of distilled water and B drinks 2 litres of isotonic saline. So the first thing is, please remember, whenever you add fluid into the body, it first goes to the extracellular compartment. By drinking 2 litres of isotonic saline, the subject B has expanded his ECF volume without any change in osmolality. But by drinking 2 litres of distilled water, subject A has not only expanded his ECF volume, but has also reduced the ECF osmolality. It has made the ECF dilute. So, let's have a look at what are the changes which are going to happen. Number one, ECF volume increases in both. ECF osmolality reduces in A but is unchanged in B. Now, because the ECF has now become dilute, water starts moving from ECF to ICF. So what will happen to ICF volume? Increases. ICF osmolality reduces. Still, it becomes equal to the ECF osmolality. Water will move from ECF to ICF till ECF and ICF osmolality is the same. In B, there is no change in the ICF volume or the osmolality. There is no shift of water. So let's have a look at the options. Let's see if we can answer them. Greater change in plasma osmolality as compared to subject A. In fact, there is no change in plasma osmolality or the ECF osmolality as compared to subject A. There is a greater change in ICF volume. ICF volume change occurs in subject A, not in B. So this is incorrect. Higher positive free water clearance. What is positive free water clearance? Positive free water clearance means that the urine is dilute. Now, in which of these two will I get a dilute urine? You must understand, now in subject A, there is a reduction in the ECF osmolality. This now reduces the secretion of ADH. Remember, ADH secretion, the most important stimulus for increase in ADH secretion is an increase in osmolality. So if there is a fall in the ECF osmolality, why is that a fall? Because we, the, the individual has drunk the, uh, distilled water. So he has diluted his ECF. So because of a reduction in ECF osmolality, there is a reduction in ADH secretion. A decrease in antidiuretic hormone means there is going to be a diuresis. And diuresis means excretion of a dilute urine, large volume of a dilute urine. So that means there is going to be a positive free water clearance. So let's go back to our options. A positive free water clearance will be in subject A, not in subject B. But the urine osmolality will be higher in B as compared to A. Why so? In A, there is reduction in the ADH secretion. In B, relatively, ADH is more. Therefore, the urinary osmolality will be higher in B as compared to A. The ADH secretion is low in A, but in B, ADH secretion at least is normal. So there will be some water absorption in uh, the collecting ducts of subject B. So a higher urinary osmolality as compared to A. So answer to this question becomes deep.